Good afternoon, everyone. We will call this regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees to order, and we will begin with our roll call. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Trustee Feimster. Here. Trustee Frankel. Are you there? I'm here. Trustee Simon Holland. I'm here. Here. I'm here. Trustee Mayor. Here. Trustee Raymond. Here. Trustee Taylor. I am here. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. We're going to have our Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask an old, longtime friend who probably now regrets that she gave me a hug on the way in, Jody Lucchese, to lead us in the pledge. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to begin. The first item on the agenda after the pledge is our public comment area um, time. And then many of you may not be uh, familiar with uh, this public comment time. This is a time when uh, citizens, um, after you fill out, fill out a yellow comment card. So if you haven't gotten a comment card and you'd like to comment, I know there's some right outside that door. So please make sure you fill that out and give it to our um, Board Executive Assistant there. Each uh, public comment will be limited to three minutes. That, and during the time, during the beginning time of the meeting, is the time for any comments about anything that does not already appear on the agenda. Um, there are also times when people that share the same view, um, you let someone comment on your behalf, you certainly don't need to, but you can certainly do that as well. And our, our uh, board assistant will call the name of the person who's up next and then the one who's on deck, if you will, that's coming up. That's coming up so that the next person, we know we have people in a couple of different overflow rooms here, so that will give someone an opportunity if they aren't here in this room to come on down and be prepared to, uh, to go next. So we'll begin at this time. Ms. Batchelder? Zach Bryerson and then Jody Fitzpatrick. Mr. Bryson, welcome, sir. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Zach Bryson. I am a Worcester High School alumnus, class of 2003. As I'm sure you've gathered, there are a large number of people here today to speak on behalf of Ron Malcolm, for who for the past 27 years and up until very recently was the varsity baseball and volleyball coach at Worcester. I would like to offer this as an introduction of sorts and tell you a little about this group of people and what we've been up to. When I first heard about the allegations made against Coach Malcolm and watched the video of the parents speaking out against him, I experienced a myriad of emotions over the period of a couple days. At first, I was angry and outraged. I was angry at the parents for their words against a man I felt they barely knew. I was outraged by the fact that in our current angst-filled world, there seems to be an extreme rush to judgment when these situations arise. Accusations are made, therefore, they must be true. I was utterly confused. How could this situation have gotten this far? I felt helpless. What could I possibly do to help a man who has meant so much to me in my life? After taking a step back from everything to let the emotions settle, I gained a new perspective on the situation. I was able to empathize with the family. These are most likely good people and their experience should not be discredited. With a clear mind, I spoke to as many people as possible to gain more insight and figure out what could be done to help. I now felt motivated and inspired. What we came up with is the Facebook group, Justice for Ron Malcolm. We created this as a forum for people to gather information, to share their stories and experiences about Coach Malcolm, and most importantly, to defend his character and protect his legacy. We created the group on January 2nd, and in a matter of a day and a half, we had almost 1,500 people. There have since been over 6,000 posts, comments, and reactions. The outpouring of love and support for Coach Malcolm has been truly spectacular to witness. Former and current students and athletes, parents from the past 27 years, colleagues from both Wooster and other schools, highly respected members of our community, and even former umpires who used to call his baseball games have come together to express their support for Coach Malcolm. We have created a voice, a very loud, spirited, compassionate voice that needs to be heard. We know you've received many letters regarding this matter, and we sincerely hope you've taken the time to read each and every one of them. In addition to the letters, we've also taken the liberty to hand you this very large stack of papers containing all the Facebook posts and comments. We trust they will be read as well. 
I have known Coach Malcolm for nearly 20 years. He has been my teacher, my coach, my mentor, but above all else, my friend. The lessons I've, the lessons I've learned from him are vast. I still have his voice and those lessons etched into my subconscious and they always seem to surface when life presents a challenge and I need them most. I've heard before that past behavior is the greatest predictor of future behavior. I could not agree more. In his wake of leadership, wisdom, dedication and love, Coach Malcolm leaves behind all of us. His students, athletes, mothers, fathers, doctors, teachers, coaches, administrators, military, servicemen and women, business owners, productive, good, hardworking people. We are the product of Ron Malcolm, and I can only hope there is a future for him to produce more. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Jody Fitzpatrick, then Carol Billet. Ms. Fitzpatrick, thank you for being here. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. I am here today to comment on two things. First is my concern over the public comment portion of the Washoe County School District Board meetings and how it was used recently. I watched on video as two parents spoke before this board on December 12, 2017. I know there are laws that protect individual rights for comment, but I am concerned that this board did not take responsible action when comments made toward a specific person in this case, Ron Malcolm, became heated and possibly slanderous. According to policy 9115 meetings of the Board of Trustees, the following is stated within. Individuals or groups making comments to the Board of Trustees shall be courteous and maintain appropriate public behavior. Boisterous conduct and remarks which are discourteous, abusive, profane, slanderous, or obscene will not be tolerated. The president of the board may terminate the right of any speaker to continue if this policy is violated. In my opinion, this policy was violated and nothing was done. The second comment I'd like to make is this. I have known Ron Malcolm for 31 years. I could tell you hundreds of stories and cite all of his wonderful qualities, but I will just conclude with what is in my heart and what I know. Ron Malcolm is not a racist or a bully. He does not have a malicious bone in his body, and there is no way he would deliberately say something to hurt or demean one of his students or his players. Ron Malcolm is one of the best men that I know. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Patrick. Carol Belay. Baloo. Sorry. And <laughs> Trevor O'Sullivan. Baloo? Baloo. Baloo. Welcome, Ms. Malou. Baloo. Thank you for being here. Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to give an example of Malcolm and what he instilled, life-lasting traits in our son. I was a parent who would intervene when I wanted my son and felt it was necessary to intervene. He loved baseball. And in his senior year, he was in Mrs. Howard's English class. She was a tough teacher. Her class was difficult, and he wasn't making the good grades. I saw this as a stumbling block to him playing ball. I went and met with Mrs. Howard, his counselor, and Casey Stevens. I wanted him out of her class. I felt he didn't need this pressure. They disagreed but would honor my request. He was to go the next day to change his schedule. So that night I told my son his schedule would be changed. Much to my surprise, he said, no, I can't give up. He said it's a challenge, but he needed to face it and try harder. What? I was upset and told him, he wasn't looking at the big picture. He said to us, you don't give up on yourself when adversity comes your way. He was a pitcher for Malcolm, and he learned from playing ball for Malcolm. When difficulties arise, that's when you stay calm, take a step back, stay strong and grounded, and press forward. He stayed in her class, and he improved. 
He went on to receive a scholarship in college and played Division I ball. When he returned from college, he went back to Wooster to thank Coach Malcolm for his guidance and the characteristics he had learned. And to Miss Howard, he thanked for her toughness. He has now taken these lessons into coaching his son's Pop Warner team. Today, I personally would like to thank Coach Malcolm for his leadership and in preparing the kids for life beyond high school. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Ballou. Trevor O'Sullivan, then Jennifer Stenko. Welcome, Mr. O'Sullivan. You have three minutes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Coach Malcolm, um, after I watched a video a few weeks ago about Coach Malcolm, Similar to what Zach Bryson said, it's you're overwhelmed with emotions and how you can help a man that has meant so much to you. Three minutes to discuss 21 years that I've known him is not even close to doing him justice on how much he's done for me. Um, I was a man that, when it comes to athletics, was not a big person, was not a strong person, um, had to overcome a lot of different things, and with his guidance and tough love at times, taught me what the real world is like. Um, he taught me how to get ready for college. He taught me how to get ready for work when you become an adult. He taught me how you need to work together with everybody, how you respect people, and they'll respect you. Um, it's, it's really, really devastating for me to hear harsh words about Malcolm like that. I've been behind closed doors with Ron Malcolm. Um, I, he's a friend of mine. And if he's a friend of mine and he would talk like he normally talks, there's not one ounce of racism or bullying in his body. Not one ounce. And I tend to hang out with people that are like me. And I get that from Malk. I have friends back here that went to Reno High. I have friends that went to Galena. And they're all, in my opinion, like me, which means they're kind of like Malk. And I'm going to leave this with one story to get under my three minutes. Motivational speeches was something that Malk has done for a long time. He's really, really good at it. And I have a stack of nickels right down there. And then I have one bent nickel right next to it. And if you take all the stack, that right now, they all have the same goal. They all want to be together, be friends together, work hard together, accomplish something as a team, and if you take one bent nickel, one person that doesn't want to actually be a part of what, it, what you're supposed to be a part of, it crumbles. I've never wanted to be a bent nickel my entire life because of Coach Mom. Thank you, Mr. O'Sullivan. Jennifer Stenko, and then Shine Volkner. Welcome, Ms. Stenko. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, board members and Superintendent Davis. My name is Jennifer Stenko, and I'm Worcester class of 2003. I'm here on behalf of Ron Malcolm. I couldn't find words of my own to describe a man who means so much to me, so I'm going to use my sister's. Like my brother before me and my sister after me, it was one of the greatest honors of my life to be taught and coached by Ron Malcolm. There aren't many people who make the choice to take on the remarkably heavy responsibility of guiding children and teens into adulthood. And I can't think of another profession that bears more weight or requires more dedication. The fate of the world lies in education. And I believe that there is no one more suited for this responsibility than Ron Malcolm. There is no one more suitable 
to be a teacher, a coach, or a mentor than Ron Malcolm. It's in his DNA. It is what he was meant to do. In my experience, no one has ever taught or coached with such purpose, such devotion to his students, to his players. His purpose has always been so much bigger, so much broader than just motivating students to get their diploma or more motivating players to win games. His purpose has been to help guide people on, on a path to discover who they really are, to help them find what they are truly capable of. His purpose is about cultivating the potential that exists inside of you, bringing that out and sharing that with everyone in your life. He has taught me and thousands of others to dig deeper, to work harder, to continue learning and continue growing, to be the best possible human being I can be. One memory I would like to share is from the 4A State Softball Championships in 2001. We were in Las Vegas, coming off a tough and emotionally charged regular season. We had lost going into championship day and had to win back-to-back -back games in order to take the title. Our morale was low, we were worn out, and we were hanging on to our hope of victory by a thread. And in that moment, Coach Malcolm showed up and he brought the entire baseball team with him. He showed up for us and he stood with us and he stood for us. The love and support he brought with him that day will be burned into my memory for the rest of my life. We came from behind and we beat Durango 9-8 to eight in the last inning to win. We took home state that day. But even more importantly, we took home the lesson of humility, perseverance, and devotion to one another. And that is something only Malcolm has taught us. And that is one thing I know we will carry with us forever. Coach Malcolm, know that you have an entire army of loving, kind, hardworking, honorable warriors that you have created standing with you now and standing with you always. We are the pillars of strength built on the foundation you created for us. We are the trees now standing tall from the seeds you planted. We are your echo. We are out in the world bringing love, honor, and respect to the lives of everyone around us. Your voice is in us all. Your lessons are now our lessons, and we are using them every single day to make our lives, to make our community, and to make this world a better place. I implore you to reinstate Ron Malcolm as the head varsity and soft volleyball coach at Worcester High School. Thank you, Ms. Stinkle. Shine Faulkner, then Norma Yope. Is it Faulkner? Faulkner, yes. Faulkner. Welcome, Ms. Faulkner. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Shine Faulkner. I have been a Reno resident since 1976. My husband, Don, and I have raised four children here. I was a teacher for nine years in California before moving to Reno. So when my children entered school, I became involved in various parent groups supporting their academic and athletic endeavors. I have been in contact with a great number of teachers and coaches in this district, but there are a few that I have maintained a relationship with after my children left school. Ron Malcolm is one of those. He is a special individual who has taught both my son and daughter that you have to work hard to do your best if you're going to succeed in life. Tough, that's Malcolm's middle name. But he is thoughtful, concerned, and supportive of his student athletes. He treats both male and female athletes the same. I believe he sees that his job is to teach them how to play and how to win. They learn everything, from the game itself to how to maintain the equipment, the court, and the field. They learn to respect their coach, their fellow players, their opponents, and themselves. Yesterday we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. Dr. King taught us to judge a person by the content of his character. I don't think this happened when Ron Malcolm was removed from his two coaching positions at Worcester High School. I join with all these people who have written to you to ask that you take a second look at this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Norma Yoke, then Pete Savage. Yoke, welcome, Ms. Yoke. Thank you. I'm a grandmother of three students at Wooster. I've been to every single baseball game for the last four years. Every time I'm in the baseball stands, the visitors, spectators, 
comment on the condition of our field. It is outstanding. And it isn't done because we have an expensive ground screw. It's because Ron Malcolm is there after every game. He's there on Saturday and Sundays, and he's there year round. He's not just there at game time. This past June, he had six varsity players sign letters to go to college to play baseball. Six. That's pretty outstanding. He not only is there at the field during baseball season, he's there year round. And he's in the classroom. And he's at the JA dance. He's there in his tuxedo and he's there for the kids. He's a chaperone. He's also at the football field every Friday night cooking up Malcolm burgers. So I don't understand how you could even consider replacing an educator for 27 years, a coach for 26 years, who would be more dedicated. I think he deserves the, con the consideration of the board to continue his job. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yilk. Pete Savage and Donna Smith. Okay, my name is Pete Savage, and I've been coaching baseball at Reno High School for the past 28 years. Over that time period, I've coached against and worked with Ron Malcolm, and here are some of my observations about Coach Malcolm. Work ethic. His work ethic is outstanding. Anybody that's coached two sports at one school for 26 years or 28 years, whatever it is, I don't know of any other coach in the district who's done that and accomplished so much. Consistency. He's a very consistent worker who shows up and coaches his athletes on a daily basis. His efforts always been the same every year, every team. He's had great teams like the 2002 state championship team, and he's had some years where he's had very little talent. His effort remains the same. He coaches every player on his team with the same goal, and that is to teach them life lessons through the game of baseball. Some coaches coach for wins. He coaches for the good of the player. Competitive discipline. The Wooster High baseball team has always competed to the best of their abilities. This is strictly due to Ron's leadership and coaching skills. His players respect the game and respect the opponent. When you coach against somebody three to four times a year for, for 28 years, you realize what that coach's main intentions are in that dugout. And his intentions are always good. They're for the betterment of the player and to respect the game. His teams have always acted with class, and they've always competed with class. Loyalty. Ron has built a culture of, of uh, Wooster High School with, through his baseball program, the classroom, and volleyball. Look at all the people here today. They're going to speak to his character. He's had several offers to leave Wooster to go to schools with more talent, but he, he de declined that, and he stayed there, and, he, and he's, a, he's a hard worker and is always for the, the betterment of the player. Ability to coach and build team chemistry. Of all the coaches that I've coached against, I think Ron has the best ability to take student athletes from diverse backgrounds and build them into a one team, one focus, one goal effort. Um, he does that every single year, obviously in both sports. In conclusion, I know Ron Malcolm very well. He is not a racist and he's not a bully. Over the past 28 years, he's proven he's not only an outstanding coach, but an outstanding man. And his only goal is to make his student athletes into better human beings. And I trust that the school board will come to a fair and equitable solution to all parties involved. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Savage. Donna Smith, then Serena Robb. Welcome, Ms. Smith. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Donna Smith, and I was the team mom of the JV and varsity baseball teams for Ron Malcolm from 2001 through 2005. Ron Malcolm is a man of many hats, but a racist or bully is not one of those. I had the pleasure of watching, learning, and experiencing his devotion to coaching and mentoring both of our sons, Tyler and Hunter Smith, who played baseball for him. During that 
period, many of our son's friends and neighbors actually moved out of the district so their kids wouldn't have to attend a high school with such a high percentage of minority students. We wanted our children to learn life skills. Diversity is part of everyday life. Ron Malcolm embraces diversity. We had an African-American athlete as well as a young woman who played on the baseball team. Ron Malcolm made special concessions for the young woman so she would have privacy dressing for practices and games. This was in a time when girls never played baseball. Ron Malcolm is an inspiring man. He was able to take a bunch of scrappy kids from all ethnicities to win a state baseball championship in 2002 by teaching them a work ethic and working towards a common goal as a team. I had the honor and privilege to not only witness one of the most exciting experiences in our son's lives, but to be part of it. Ron Malcolm made our kids want to be better people. Long after sports and high school are gone and they become productive members of adults, his speeches, motivation, long hard workouts created positive adults and then passes it on to the next generation. I sincerely hope that Washoe County School District listens to the outpouring of support for a man who deserves to follow his teaching and his career. Ron Malcolm has been a mentor to many, a friend, a teacher, and a coach. Sincerely, Donna Smith, AKA Tima. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Serena Robb, then Dave Sauter. Welcome, Ms. Robb. Thank you for being Thank you. here. Good afternoon. My name is Serena Robb, and I'm a retiree with 36 years of employment with the Washoe County School District. The majority of those years were spent in high school administration. Ten of those years were at Wooster High School. I am not here to question the decision of the board, but rather to discuss with you and hope that you will look at the, the situation with Ron and hopefully come to a decision where perhaps Give him the opportunity to grow and to change and to meet the standards which you are seeking. In the many years that I was Mr. Malcolm's supervisor, I knew him as a committed faculty member of our, to our school and to our students. His commitment to Wooster and his work ethic, as been mentioned, is legendary. And that field is an example of how hard he has worked. But he was also very, very, very strong in the classroom as well. I know from the many interactions that I had with Mr. Malcolm, um, he, I never had a problem with him, nor did he ever malign a student. He could be brash. Those of us who knew, knew Ron can be brash. He could be brash. And he could be somewhat direct at times. But he never, never maligned a student. And he was always there for them. When I was directed by the school board to leave Wooster to be the first principal at Damani Ranch High School, I was very sad. And I looked for people that would help me make that transition. And Ron Malcolm was one of them. And I went to him and I said, Ron, would you please come with me? We're going to an empty lot. We have to build the program. We have to recruit the kids. And I need your support. And he said no, because he wouldn't leave Wooster and he wouldn't leave the commitment to the kids that he worked with so well. So I implore you to please reconsider your decision. Allow Ron the opportunity to grow and change. And the many, many students that he has affected and the many people that have grown from him have learned from him. He is a remarkable man. He's a charismatic man. He cares. He loves Wooster High School. And I'd just like to see him reinstated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robin. Thank you for your service to the district. Dave Zotter, then Fernando Benitez. Is it Zotter? Thank you, board. Thank um, you for being here. I'm also uh, 36 years of Washoe County School District, and I'm still part-time as the high school ski race coordinator under um, Roland Stallworth. So, um, and I was part of the faculty of Serena that she's been talking about. 26 of my 36 years were at Wooster. 26 of those years I coached. I coached football, I coached track, I coached cross country, ski racing. Um, I spent many, many, many hours with Ron Malcolm. All different types of meetings, teacher meetings, um, I pre IB meetings, everything you can imagine. Um, we shared athletes. I taught his kids. Never ever once during that time frame was there anything at all that I would ever consider about Ron to be 
in a bully type situation and or racist. He's the hardest working man I've ever seen. I've taken a lot from him. I used to program a lot of what I did based on what he did because I respected his work ethic and how well he coached. Um, as coaches, we have a bag of motivational tools that we have to use all the time. And you don't know which one of those tools is going to work. You, you pull one out, you go with it. Everybody has a plan. Time is, is one thing we don't have as coaches, and so we have to make the most of it. Um, there's no way that Ron Malcolm would ever sabotage his own program. There's no way he, would, he could ever say anything to one of his players that would set him back. All he wanted to do is move forward. All he wants to do is the best that he can do for those kids to make them better athletes and better people. As a ski race coordinator, I'm very, very familiar with the policy, Washington County School District policy on bullying and harassment. And I can tell you this, I know Ron. I've known him in, for a long, long time. There's no premeditation here. There's no intent. There was nothing. It might not have been the best tool that he pulled out of his bag that day. I wasn't there. I don't know. I know this. I know that there's no possible way that he would ever ever consider hurting one of the kids he coached. As a lot of people here have also already said, I really wish you would reconsider. I wish you'd take a look at this situation from a different angle, be objective, and make the right decision. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Stothard, and thank you as well for your over 30 years of service. Fernando Benitez, then Bo Walker. Welcome, Mr. Benitez. Thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. Hello, my name is Fernando Benitez, Wooster High School, class of 2004. Uh, Ron Malcolm was uh, my teacher and also my uh, varsity baseball coach. The years I spent at Wooster were some of the best years of my life because of the positivity around me. My family, teachers, coaches, and coaches like Ron Malcolm, they helped create a positive environment for me and teaching me so many life lessons that I carry with me to this day. Uh, during this time, during my high school years, I spent more time with Coach Malcolm than I did my own parents. He is not a racist and he is not a bully. Uh, he, he made a positive influ influence in my life as well as countless others as you, as you can see, and that should not be taken lightly. I asked the board to decide to, to do one thing, to focus on the positive. He made a positive influence in so many people's lives. Let's not focus on the one negative. Over 27 years, he was at Wooster. So many positive uh, stories come out, as you guys are hearing. Let's not focus on one negative. The solution is not to chew him up, spit him out, and destroy him and just call it good. We did something about it and destroy everything he's built at Wooster High School. Let's get this right. Let's reinstate Coach Malcolm. Thank you, Mr. Benitez. Bo Walker, then Jeff Turnsey. Welcome, Mr. Walker. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and thank you guys for having us. Um, the first thing I want to say is that it is uh, atrocious that coaching is an at-will position in our district. Um, the time and energy it takes for us to dedicate to student-athletes is um, should be looked at more than it should not be up to one person whether or not we get to survive in a job or not, and that's outside of the Coach Malcolm situation, but just in coaching in general. It being at-will is atrocious for the time we put in. Um, let me get to my letter. My name is Bo Walker, and I'm an AP U.S. History teacher and head baseball coach in this school district. I graduated from Wooster High School in 2002, and I coached at Wooster from 2004 to 2010. You may not know who I am right now, but you will, because one day I will be a principal in this district. <laughs> I have a passion for leadership and working with teachers and students. I love creating a shared vision and goals and working with, in a team environment to achieve those goals. My passion for leadership was learned through the lessons that were taught to me directly from Coach Malcolm. I remember a few years ago, 
the district rolling out book clubs, and the book was uh, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. And I remember going through and, and reading these, um, <clears throat> sorry, and reading, uh, and one of the quotes I brought today was, if parents want to give their children a gift, the best thing they can do is to teach their children to love challenges and to be engaged and intrigued by mistakes. Enjoy effort and keep on learning. That way, their children do not become slaves of praise. They will have a lifelong way to build and repair their own confidence. For many of us at Wooster High School, we don't come from families that provided that environment for us. <clears throat> so we had to get it elsewhere. And for most of us, it was through the coaching and leadership of Ron Malcolm. As we continued reading this book by Carol Dweck, um, I just was, I was in awe of the information, not because it was new to me, but because it was something I had learned 15 years before on the baseball field under Coach Malcolm. Um, Coach Malcolm was teaching us these lessons long before the district found about, about this book and how to make students more successful through a growth mindset. Coach Malcolm has wanted nothing but the best for a student athlete since the day he started Wooster High School. More than any other person in my educational journey, Malcolm has taught me the lessons that I needed to be the best version of myself. Sorry. <clears throat> I have a lot more in my letter, which I sent to you guys, and you guys can read. Um, but I think along with what Ms. Robb said, I want to leave you with a, a quote from Carol Dweck's book, Growth Mindset. Don't judge. Teach. It's a learning process. Thank you. Thank you, future Principal Walker. <laughs> Jeff Turnseed, then Steve Miller. Is it Turnseed, sir? Turnipseed. Turnipseed? Turnipseed. Like oh, Turnipseed. Yep. Oh, like a turnipseed. Yep. Okay, well, welcome, Mr. Turnipseed. You'll never hear of me again because I'm not going to be a principal in this. Year. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being here, sir. But I've been a Wooster parent for five years now, and... Honestly, I'm lukewarm on Wooster itself, but Ron Malcolm uh, made an impression on me that has, you know, made me lose some sleep lately over his current predicament. And uh, what we know so far, being the general public, everybody behind this podium, we know the Chatfield side of the story because they're sort of in a bully pulpit position where they get to talk and nobody else is allowed to because it's a personnel matter. And it's, uh, you know, gag orders, legal appeals, all this stuff. So... We're relying on the uh, the crack staff over at the Gazette Journal that presented a nice, well-rounded piece, gave us three sides of the story, the student's story, the mom's story, and the father's story. And that's all we got. So I'm left wondering what's the other side of the, of the story, these accusations that have been leveled. And you guys may know this. I know this this whole coaching removal wasn't your decision. It's people down the chain, but um, I'm hoping you guys can look at the other side of the story. And I'm wondering, did Coach Malcolm reach out to the student's family for a personal meeting, a personal apology? And if so, was that granted or rebuffed? I'm wondering, has the coach sought counseling to better himself? And was that taken into consideration on his removal from coaching? And I'm like these other folks that have already spoken, I'm just wondering either uh, Malcolm's been bullying and, and being a racist for 27 years undetected, which seems highly unlikely. It's possible that uh, this is, you know, one of many, many incidents that Wooster administration has just swept under the rug, also highly unlikely. Or it's possible that this is an extremely isolated incident that, uh, you know, I've screwed up in my career and it didn't cost me my job. And I think everybody in this room can say the same thing. And I hope that you guys will reconsider um, having read that thick stack of paper that was given to you with all the social media posts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turnip Seat. Steve Miller, then Alyssa Mallorca. Welcome, uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you for thank being you. here. Uh, my name is Steve Miller. Uh, my son, Ryan Miller, is a junior IB student at Wooster High School. Uh, I've gotten to know Coach Malcolm over the last couple of years, um, and I had a prepared speech, but in listening, and listening to what everybody else has said, kind of changed my mind on, on what I want to say. 
Uh, first of all, uh, my son wanted to do the IB program, and uh, we're not zoned for Wooster High School. Uh, I was pretty much against going to Wooster, and uh, Coach Malcolm uh, was a convincing force to to have uh, have my son go to Wooster High School. Uh, we talked quite a bit before before the before the summer uh, uh, baseball program, and and. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted my son to go to Reno High and play for Coach Savage uh, because I didn't know anything other other than that in, in the Reno market. Um, in talking to, to other players and people that had played for Coach Malcolm in the past, um, I decided to give, you know, give, give uh, my son the opportunity to go to the IB program and, and also play for Coach Malcolm. I think that uh, in this day and age, people forget about, you know, dedication in a work in a workforce and how hard it is to get people to be dedicated and have the passion to stay, you know, with one company or or, or one school as Coach Malcolm has done for 27 years, and to just discard somebody for an alleged mistake, I, I believe is is a horrible thing. I, as a business owner in town here, I, I've given many people second and third chances. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I ask that you please consider giving Coach Malcolm another chance. A as a parent, I feel cheated. My, my son's a junior. He's going into, you know, a, a, you know his junior, and junior year of high school. Uh, baseball, and that's an important year if if he wants to continue and play onward in, at the next level, at the college level. And you know, not having Coach Malcolm as his coach is going to severely affect that opportunity. As was stated earlier, you know, we had six players get to play uh, at the college level this year, and, and quite frankly, you know, as a observer, you know, I'm not so sure that. I, I would have considered them college potential, but with M Malcolm's help, they got the opportunity, and that's all we need in life is an opportunity. And I ask you to give Coach Malcolm the opportunity to coach again, please. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Alyssa Malorca, then Kimberly Lawrence. Help me, Malorca. Help me, yeah. Malorca. Okay, thank you for being there. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Alyssa Malorca, and I'm speaking on behalf of teacher and coach Ron Malcolm. I, and as many before me, feel deeply disheartened by the allegations of racism and bullying that are being processed against him, as I do not believe them to be true. I believe there is a complete misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the situation. I'm a former student, volleyball player, and had the opportunity to coach under the direction of Mr. Malcolm for roughly four years. He is an inspirational mentor, father figure, coach, teacher, and friend. Malcolm is a man of great character and will always have your best interest to his heart. He will push you to the limits of your strengths, weaknesses, emotions, and ultimately to become the best human being you can be. This can be seen in class, on the field, on the court, as a coach, and even as a colleague. I owe part of being the woman I am today to Malcolm and feel sadness for those that may not have the opportunity to experience what I did because it is a true honor. Worcester, <coughs> excuse me, Worcester is a highly diverse school that does not go unnoticed, which I believe made it such a great school to attend. We are unique in many ways, which brought the Worcester community to closer together. Malcolm has been present throughout Worcester's diversity and has embraced it with open arms for roughly 30 years. He has thrived throughout his career and always put his students first, sometimes even in front of his own family or well-being. He is a devoted man to his students and has an, um, only wants the best outcome for whatever it may be. I have seen him firsthand make sure a student that wanted to try out for volleyball had the capabilities to, or a student was even fed, even if that meant the expense of his own livelihood, and this was executed without a single doubt. He would spend countless hours on an astounding standing slideshow for all levels of his volleyball program, even if that meant losing all hours of his sleep, just because he knew the experience that these girls was, were going to have and wanted to have for the rest of their lives and to reflect on. Um, 
through the toughest time of my life and losing my father, Malcolm was one of the first people to offer me his support and continue to provide it for my grievance. With that being said, I just know in my heart, Malcolm would do nothing or would never intentionally or maliciously hurt an individual because it's just not in his nature. To end, I just can only imagine the stress and turmoil the individuals of these parties and families are undergoing and my hope, no matter the outcome of the situation, there's eventual peace and forgiveness found in the lives between everyone involved in this matter. May we learn and grow from the situation as coaches, teachers, administrators, principals, students, and parents, and generally as human beings. Thank you, Ms. Malarka. Kimberly Lawrence, then Jerry Lazari. Ms. Lawrence, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Kimberly, and I'm speaking on behalf of <clears throat> excuse me, Lily Jacobson, who couldn't be here today. Dear Ms. Kusher and the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees, I am writing to protest the removal of Ron Malcolm as Wooster High School's volleyball and baseball coach. I played baseball for Coach Malcolm from 2003 to 2006 and was the first female in the state of Nevada to play 4A varsity high school baseball. This gender barrier was broken because Ron Malcolm was the only coach in the city willing to give me a fair chance. When other coaches denied me opportunities, Coach Malcolm was brave enough to risk, uh, to risk and stand up for equality and justice. He told me from the beginning, if you're a ball player, you're a ball player. And if you can contribute to the team, I'll give you a shot. This was not merely a lip service. Coach Malcolm did everything he could to make me feel like I was, <clears throat> like I was any other player on the team. He gave me opportunities to shine. He restored not only my confidence in myself, but also my faith in the world as just a fair place. After high school, I went on to play for the, <clears throat> the U.S. Women's National Baseball Team, and I would, never had the, I would have never had the opportunity if it weren't for, the, uh, for Ron Malcolm's bravery and mentorship. My baseball career would, not, would have ended, my base, sorry, my baseball career would have ended as a yet another girl who had been told she could not achieve something because of her gender. This is merely one example of Ron Malcolm's positive impact on so many young people's lives and his dedication to Wooster High School and the Reno community. The allegations made by Ken and Sharice Chatfield did not fit the person I know Ron Malcolm to be, and I find them hard to believe. I do not deny that there are uh, systemic issues of racism at Wooster and in the Wooster <coughs> and in the Washoe County School District and across the, the country. What Hannah, has to, what Hannah has had to endure is inexcusable and should be addressed in an in institutional level. However, removing Ron Malcolm as a coach, someone who has devoted his life to educating young people in Washoe County, is not a pro the appropriate response. It is using unfounded allegations as a, ra as, a, as a rationable to punish one man while ignoring the larger systemic issue. Not only that, but it will also deny the future students opportunity to learn from a master teacher and coach. You would be doing a disservice to the community rather, uh, rather than addressing this a serious problem. I urge you to reconsider your actions and to give this man the respect he deserves. He has given himself to Wooster High for decades and he has shown a commitment to equality and fairness. I would not be the person I am today without his influence and there are many other students who would say the same. Please fight for justice in the same way Coach Malcolm has. Do the right thing and reinstate Ron Malcolm for the 2018 baseball and volleyball season. Sincerely, Lily Jacobson. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Lawrence. <laughs> Jerry Lazari, then Michael Lazari. Uh, Welcome, Mr. Lazari. Thank you. It's nice to see you all. Um, I've known Ron Malcolm for over 25 years and uh, I met him uh, through baseball, but it became much more. And what I have been inspired by, um, number one, I'm a 1972 graduate of Wooster High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, had, I sent my kids to Wooster High School for reasons of Ron Malcolm. I knew the kind of diversity that they would encounter while they were there. I moved to an area so that they could reside in that area, go to Wooster. And the Malcolm I know is a man of high morals, high values, commitment. It's not just being an educator. 
he has taught life lessons. My kids have gone on and done successful things. One of them's done dangerous things, and you'll hear from him. And um, the echo that they have heard, as my middle daughter put it, is the voice of Ron Malcolm. Malcolm can be rough and Malcolm can be tough, but Malcolm's heart is the biggest that I know. He would do nothing to maliciously hurt someone. Maybe he said an inappropriate thing at an inappropriate time, but we've all made those mistakes. I think as you can see here today, the number of people that have been affected by this man, the school district that has been affected by this man, the community that has been affected by this man, exhibits his morals, values, commitment, dedication to Wooster, Washoe County, and our entire community. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lazari. And this is Michael Lazari. Another welcome, Mr. Lazari. Then Janet Moran. Hey. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Lazari. Uh, I played for Coach Malcolm back in the 90s, as did my two younger sisters after me. Um, and we played on teams of every ethnic origin I can think of, um, as did everybody who has ever played at Wooster High School, um, which immediately poses the question, what are we missing here? What are we missing? I'm also a U.S. Marine and a war veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. I bring this up only to illustrate something important that I see. You see, wars usually start because somebody makes an assumption, an assumption based on fear. And then out of fear, they attack. This pattern occurs on all levels of human conflict, from personal relationships to global ones. And we all do this. We all do this. This is why we all say we want peace, but we end up fighting wars on every scale. Wars within ourselves, wars within our personal relationships, wars within our communities, and wars out, in, out on into the world. I do this. You do this. We all do this. We know we do. The whole world does. And this has been passed down to us since, since probably the beginning of human history. When we live in fear, we assume out of fear, and we blame out of fear, and we attack out of fear. But what if we didn't? What if we did something else? What if instead we asked the difficult questions before we reached for blame? What if we started the difficult conversation before the attack? How much might be saved? And how much courage might this take? In a society ran on fear, probably almost, almost an impossible amount. Almost. Nothing will change until we change. Nothing will get more genuine until we get more genuine. And nobody will get any braver until someone does. I don't know what the deeper truth is, but I'll bet you there is one. And do we have the courage to find it together? To the young woman and her parents involved in this ordeal, I hope you get everything you need, everything you need to feel whole and happy. I truly, truly do. And to Malk, my sister Maggie said it perfectly. You have an entire army of heart warriors who love you of whom you've guided and helped create. Your echo, who stand with you through whatever life brings and who evoke change in the world wherever they go. And to you all, I wish you all the courage in the world. All the courage in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lazari. And thank you for your service to this country. Janet Moran, then Andy Black. Welcome, Ms. Moran. You have three minutes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have been seriously disturbed since I found out um, what happened to Ron Malcolm and he lost his coaching duties. Um, let me just tell you that I don't waste my time or my energy uh, or sacrifice my energy to bullies and abusers. I've been 
um, on the receiving end of bullying behavior my entire life, um, starting in childhood. And I'm also an empath, so they can smell me and they go after me. Bullies usually, you know, go after me. Um, my daughter and I met Ron Malcolm in 2006. Um, he was one of the first people that welcomed Megan Moran to uh, Worcester High School. He was so happy that she decided to attend. Um, she was um, zoned for McQueen, and she wanted to attend the IV program, and she did not want to um, be coached by the abusive coach at, uh, at McQueen, who has been terminated, I believe, for her behavior. It took years, by the way, to get rid of her. Um, my first memory of Malcolm was a pool party in his backyard. Nobody even talked about the pool. He's, 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 ama he's an amazing man in every way. Um, I'm, I was so impressed by him. Um, spent a lot of time with him. He, he lived in our neighborhood. And we made, I made real heart connections with him, his family, his, um, and, and Megan did too. Um, they were wonderful, real, genuine people. I never witnessed anything and ever with Malcolm, ever, nothing. N nothing that would uh, disturb me, except he was tough, there's no question. He was tough, but in, in a good way. You know, you're not gonna get kids that can succeed in life by, um, by coddling them. That's my opinion. Um, and I, I love this man, Megan loved this man, he had passion. And that's probably what gets him in trouble. It's what gets me in trouble. I'm very passionate, too. Um, but I, I have heart. He has heart. He has a huge heart. And he was just like everyone else has said before me. You know, he's just trying to get the best out of these kids. He definitely was there for the kids, not for the school, not for, the, you know, what the paper would write about the school. He was there for the kids. Um, and I was impressed that Megan, you know, wanted to attend Worcester. And it's definitely to her advantage that she did. You know, she's very successful. She's, um, she's in Southern California. She has a great job. She couldn't be here today. Um, but I just wanted to, to end this with, you know, I understand what it's like to work with children. I'm a former teacher myself. It's not the same as parenting, um, although parents that don't work with children in the trenches um, think it is. So um, I hope that this can get turned around. Um, thank you, Ms. Moran. I'm sorry your you. time is up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Andy Black. Andy Black, then Aiden Finnell. Welcome, Mr. Black. Thank you for being here, sir. Hi, thank you. And I promised my wife I'd keep it short and sweet, so I'll give it a t whirl. Um, my son, Tyler Black, graduated last year from Wooster, uh, spent four years playing for, for Coach Malcolm. Uh, he's now at, at the college level and, uh, and doing very well. And he attributes much of his success to, to Coach Malcolm uh, on the field, but uh, it, it goes far more than that. And just, you know, I want to concur with everyone speaking before me that uh, the biggest, you know, lessons are, are life lessons that Coach Malcolm has handed off to our youth and, 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 and the community. And, um, you know, almost three decades of, of teaching and coaching. I know this, that Coach Malcolm is, is coaching or was coaching and is, is teaching for the right reasons. Um, his heart's in it, and he truly cares about, uh, you know, especially the youth. Um, you know, integrity and character, that keeps coming up. But I'll tell you this, that uh, to me, those are the most important aspects of humanity, is integrity and character. And, you know, there's, he's one of the top five in my life. And, and, uh, and I know so many others in this community. Um, so, uh, I didn't write anything down, sorry. <laughs> uh, going back to Tyler though, um, you know, he was slated to go to Reno High and, and, uh, you know, he, he made a conscious choice to go to, to go to Wooster and he, he, uh, he, he was offered a, um, to go there in the IB program, and he, he received an IB uh, certificate. Uh, but to be honest, it was all because of Coach Malcolm. I mean, and the IB program is a great program, uh, but you know, it, it, the decision was was because of the, how how amazing that man was, and and the life lessons that he taught my son. Um, 
it's, it's intangible. And I know it goes far, you know, beyond everyone even in this room. I mean, three decades of, of, of gifts that he has, um, you know, instilled in our youth. I mean, you can't turn away from that. Um, you know, and, and, and this one incident is, is, you know, to me, uh, my humble opinion, the punishment, uh, if he's not able to coach after this far outweighs, uh, you, you know, the, the crime. Um, and I think we all have to step back and, and look at it and, 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 you know, do the right thing, which is let him coach again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Black. Aiden Finnell, yeah. then Sally Lowe. Welcome, Ms. Finnell. You have three minutes, ma'am. Hello. My name is Aiden Finnell. I'm a 2011 graduate and former volleyball player from Worcester High School. I'm here today to express my thoughts in regards to Ron Malcolm's allegations and to speak on behalf of a former student athlete who was not able to attend today's meeting. His name is Andrew Galindo and is also a former student athlete from Worcester. We've all seen situations like this where decisions seem to have already been made. Though we are hopeful that Malcolm will regain his coaching positions, we know this is more of a formality. So we would like to take this time to appreciate Coach Malcolm for what he has done for us as young adults. Malcolm, thank you for playing a major role in both of our lives. The guidance, discipline, life lessons, lessons of the game, caring about our well-being, teaching us right from wrong, and preparing us for the world beyond those high school halls. In many instances, you are what comes to mind. What would Malcolm do or say? We wouldn't be half the people we are today if it weren't for you. Andrew Galindo and I ask that you take into consideration the amount of support that has showed up for Malcolm today, the lives he has shaped for the better, his commitment to the students in school, and ultimately his true character. He is by not by any means not he is not by any means a racist or a bully. In closing, we thank you for your time, and to Coach Malcolm, we love you. Thank you, Ms. Finnell. Sally Lou, then Ronald Lewis. Welcome, Ms. Lou. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's Sally Lux. Lux. Please excuse me. That's all right. Me. Welcome, Ms. Lux. Um, I am not here as a school board person or a school district person. I'm here as Ron Malcolm's neighbor. I have, um, I was, however, a Wooster graduate when Ron was probably 10 years old. <laughs> I have been blessed to um, have two really wonderful neighbors. Incidentally, they were both Wooster coaches, Neil Sanders and Ron Malcolm, Ron and Terry Malcolm. Um, when this started, I could tell something was going on, even though they weren't speaking about it, because I saw Ron Malcolm's car home more than it has been home in the 16 years we've been neighbors. He's always at Worcester High School. His, um, and I could see just a negative impact on the whole family. Ron is so devoted to Worcester, to the high school, to the students, to his players, long beyond the time that they spend under his care. I have um, seen kids of every creed, color, style come to their home as friends of their boys who are incredibly fine young men themselves. Um, I too didn't write really anything down by making some little notes. He loves his teams. He's a, such a wonderful neighbor that there's three of us in our small little cul-de-sac, three homes. I recently lost my husband and our neighbor in between is an elderly woman. If it snows, all of our sidewalks are plowed every morning before I even get out of bed, before Ron goes to school at 7 o'clock. They, they never ask for anything. If you ask their kids to do something, they always do it. You can never pay them. They're the most wonderful neighbors I've been blessed to have. And I'm speaking on this because not how he has treated whatever happened at school. Ron is a good person. He has high morals, incredible integrity. He'd be there for you if you need him at any time. And sure, I know he's intense with his students and with his teams, but he's more intense with himself. I noticed after the um, gag order was lifted, I saw Ron bringing home large 
lawn equipment to his house. And I thought, uh oh, something happened. This was all heavy equipment that Ron Malcolm has bought himself to keep up the grounds at Wooster. He's there every weekend. You might find another person to coach these teams, but you will never, ever replace Ron Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lux. Ronald Lewis, then Tyler Vetter. Mr. Lewis, welcome, sir. You have three minutes. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to be here and have this opportunity. First, I'd like to just highlight a couple of things. I've, I'm just so personally moved by the test, I'll say testimony, the verbal comments of the people that have come to speak on coach's behalf. And I'm going to kind of characterize mine in a different view. I've known Ron uh, not that long, 20, a little over 20-some years, and he has coached and taught life lessons. You've heard that from young people, parents, and those are the important things of life, I believe. He's really created new members for our society that have character and embody those traits. In my view, in my direct observation of uh, Coach Malcolm, he's a positive leader and he's had a positive influence on so many people that you've heard have uh, given their comments today. I base my comments on a number of things. My experience is not that important. I student taught in Warshaw County. I went in the service. Vietnam was winding down. Continue to serve in the service. Yeah. Proud of that. I came back, worked in Warshaw County for a number of years as a counselor, school psychologist, and a number of years at Wooster High School as a school psychologist. I had direct observation of Coach Malcolm, and he's a positive influence. We are all the product of our past experiences, and I base that upon my, and I want to really characterize this, my expert testimony in behavior. I've studied for many years B.F. Skinner, and many of the things that you've heard in here are how Coach has influenced others in a positive way. Other aspects of B.F. Skinner comes into things called private events, intent. Who can measure the allegations that are here, the allegations that really delve on intent? That's what you have to grapple with. Let me try to sum up a little bit. One of our previous speakers talked about your serious and very important opportunity here. I ask you to reconsider this situation with Coach. As uh, Coach Savage says, consider reinstating him. How can this situation be turned into a positive outcome, a good opportunity for all parties, a win-win opportunity? I know how it can be. You need to grapple with that, and it's hard. It is very hard. If Coach Malcolm is not able to continue as a coach, it'll be egregious injustice to future students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis, and thank you for your service to our country in this district. Tyler Vetter, then Steve Bryson. Welcome, Mr. Feather. You have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm a graduate from this latest class is 2017. I was lucky enough to play Wooster baseball, basketball, and football, and I wasn't very good at school for my first two years. Um, I started off with a 2.2 GPA, and then when baseball season kicked in, uh, Ron Malcolm was there. Um, he's an exceptional man. I have nothing bad to say about him. He's been there for me 24-7. He's the father I never had. Uh, my father left me on us, too. Um, he took me under his wing. Um, every umpire through the 4A division um, thinks I'm his son, Alex Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for my first four years, my first year of baseball, I was unable to play due to a ligament in my elbow. Um, that began to tear when I started throwing the baseball for the first year. 
Uh, Ron Malcolm was there for me every day. He told me to do Jaeger bands. He wanted me out there as soon as possible. My second year, I was able to play. Uh, third year, I couldn't. Um, I broke my fibula in a basketball game that put me out for six to eight weeks. Um, this was towards the end of the basketball season. He helped me recover. He cared about me like I was his own son. And most of my teammates over here uh, known me as the cripple that was always hurt. <laughs> yeah, uh, I always had crutches when during the baseball season. Um, but Ron Malcolm, he's he's exceptional. Um, as I, I'm pretty sure everyone who's been coached by Ron Malcolm um, knows the code of the Colts and. The first line is, if you think he's beaten, you are. And Ron Malcolm does not think he's beaten. He's going to keep fighting for what he loves, and what he loves is coaching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fair. Steve Bryson, then Sheila Lovell. Lovell. We're going to call her Sheila. Hi, folks. Welcome, Mr. Bryson. Doing? Good. Um, yeah, just a... Brief background, um, both my son and my daughter uh, played for Coach Malcolm. Uh, my son played baseball, my daughter played volleyball. And so he had um, direct um, influence on their lives uh, over the course of seven years. And um, I was also an assistant football coach at Wooster High School during uh, the time that, well, of course he's been there for 27 years. And so, um, and I was also a, a a long time ago Wooster graduate. But anyway, um, the thoughts that have run through my mind uh, today have been regarding um, a talk that I heard uh, all pro safety Ronnie Lott, who uh, played for the 49ers, give at the Boys and Girls Club here uh, quite a few years ago. And um, he spoke about uh, growing up <clears throat> as a young uh, African American, um, uh, with a, in a single parent household, um, and um, he speaks about a mother that, as growing up, he thought that she was the meanest person that ever walked the face of the earth because all she talked about was um, taking the garbage out and doing your homework and washing the dishes and listening to your pastor and listening to your coach and and um, paying attention. Um, uh, in the classroom. And uh, he said it wasn't until he went off to college on a football scholarship to USC that he realized that his mother, when she was telling him to take out the trash and do his homework and uh, do whatever, clean up his rooms, she wasn't telling him to do that. She was telling him that she loved him. And um, I think that embodies Ron Malcolm. And we've all heard that times that he can be a taskmaster, and um, but uh, he doesn't do it um, out of any kind of um, malice or um, any kind of ill intent. He does it because he loves the kids, and they're better people because of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Sheila Loris, then John England. Ms. Loris, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, board. Uh, my name is Sheila Loris. Uh, I am a substitute teacher here at the Washoe County School District. I'm also a recipient of the um, NV Teach Scholarship. And um, I'm here because upon completing the um, scholarship um, and attending um, Grand Canyon University, also upon completing each of the requirements from uh, the ARL program, um, I was to uh, receive, which I did receive a scholarship, the NV Teach Scholarship. and. Um, I was denied the stipend uh, that came along with the uh, NV Teach uh, Scholarship um, because they said that I didn't pass the Praxis test. 
but the Praxis test is separate from the NVT scholarship. And uh, there's no requirements from the NVT scholarship that uh, requires you to take the Praxis. However, to become in the hiring pool, here in the district, you do have to take the practice. I'm quite aware of that. Um, however, they're two separate entities. And I have been um, speaking with, um, um, following protocol um, as far as who I'm supposed to speak with and who I have spoken with, um, the, the very first person um, who I was working with was Sierra Mara and Terriano, who is um, a technician in the um, Human Relations Department, who brought it to my attention because I had not passed uh, the praxis, I would not be able to receive the stipends that came along with um, the NV um, Teach Scholarship. And I'm almost upon graduating. Um, this is my second to the last um, class that I've taken, and I'll be getting my uh, master's degree in uh, special education. And I would like to receive the stipend um, that is almost close to $10,000 due me, because I've been um, in the class, um, in, in taking classes uh, for uh, two years now, upon uh, graduating March of this year. And thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Loris. John England, then John Presado. Welcome, Mr. England. Thank you. Good afternoon. 24 years ago this month, I met Ron Malcolm. I was one of a new uniform provider for him and a supplier, and he was none too happy. My company had just discontinued his brand new uniforms only a year after buying them. So he was in not the best mood. But at the end of the conversation, I basically had to do what a salesman had to do. And I said, would you like to buy something from me? And for the next 24 years, Ron Malcolm demonstrated to me what he's demonstrated and lived out to his student athletes and students the quality and character of loyalty. He is stuck by me through good and bad, just the way he's done with his kids. He understands the principle of sticking by kids, whether they're winning or losing. And he's taught them, as he's taught me, that loyalty means honor and respect empowerment, and believing in someone when they don't believe in themselves. Ron Malcolm is not a bully. He is a mentor. He is an encourager. And our community is blessed to have a man like that that has stayed at Wooster year in and year out, when so many other opportunities for him as a baseball coach came and went, and yet he stayed at that school because he not only believed in his baseball field, he believed in the kids that played on that field. And it would be a great injustice to our community in what we're trying to teach children about what it means to have longevity, what it means to have loyalty, what it means to have respect. He's shown all of those things to these children who are now adults in our community, many of them. I beg you and I ask you to consider reinstating him. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. England. John Persado, then Courtney Lang. Is it Persado? We get that. Preciado. Preciado. Good afternoon. I think, uh, I think I've known Ron Malcolm longer than anybody in this room or anybody else that's known Ron Malcolm here in Reno. I first met Ron Malcolm in 1985 when he came to the University of Nevada. Ron and I were teammates in the baseball program at the university. And I can honestly say that in the whole time I've known Ron Malcolm that 
he's never been a malicious man, uh, that he's never said anything, demonstrated any type of behavior that would indicate that he had any racial, racist thoughts in that whole time I've known him. I think it's important to realize that the year in which I met Ron Malcolm and then between that year and the year he started his career with the school district, Ron didn't have to conduct himself under any code of conduct. Ron was a young man, and as we all know, young men, their decision-making process and their filters and their frontal cortex isn't always completely developed, and, and I've never heard him say anything since the day I met him that would lead me to believe that he had a racist bone in his body. I'm overwhelmed by everything I've heard today, especially from his former athletes and students. To know that there's a man in our community that has, has had such an impact on young people is amazing to me. I feel sorry for the future generation of Wooster High School student athletes and students that may not have the opportunity to be positively affected by Ron Malcolm. I've read a lot of articles, research articles, talking about how important it is for an adolescent to have an adult in their life that they can speak to who is not a parent, who is not an uncle, who is not a relative. And for my children, I always consider Ron Malcolm one of those people. I am honored to know this man. We are blessed to have him as a friend, and not just me, my wife and my children. And I hope that an equitable resolution to this situation can come to a head. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Preciado. Courtney Lang, then Jessica Bailey. Ms. Lang, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Courtney Lang. I have known Ron Malcolm for 11 years now. I played varsity volleyball for three years in high school, and I played on the freshman team. Um, I also played varsity softball and found his support there. Um, I found out about this, it was, I don't know, maybe a month ago or however long ago it was, and I actually found out I was at his house and his son told me I was over there getting a letter of recommendation um, for a program for school that I'm trying to get into 11 years later and I am still coming to him for support. I'm still looking to him for words of encouragement and, and help, really. Um, I was out of school for three years. I'm a single mom to a five-year-old little girl and he is who I come to when I need support to push forward through the challenges that I have faced. I come from a very good support system. My parents are outstanding, um, but they live in Oregon. And in high school, I had a great home life, but when I came to school, he was my father figure. And I had a good home life at school as well because I had him there to support me and to push me and to believe in me. He brought me on when I was a sophomore. In high school, he brought me onto the varsity volleyball team as a setter. We were fresh out of one, and it was my second year setting, and he threw me in, and he pushed me, and he believed in me, and I started as a setter, as a sophomore on the varsity volleyball team because of his work ethic and his drive that he instilled into me. Um, about a year and a half ago is when I was going through my breakup with my daughter's dad, and I was at Rayleigh's. I had $26 in my account trying to get groceries for my kid and I saw him there and it was like I, I was having the same reaction as soon as I saw him I grabbed him I hugged him and I cried in the middle of the grocery store and he reassured me that I was going to be okay that I had this and that I was a good mom and that I was going to get through it for my kid and Still, after 10 years, he believes in me, and he keeps in contact with me. My daughter is well aware of who he is. She knows I'm here today. She is five years old, asking if she could come and if she could show her support for him as well. She asks to go to his house to eat his cauliflower tater tots, which are very good, actually. Um, 
But that in itself, my five-year-old daughter recognizes how good of a man he is and how welcoming and warm their family is. He is not a racist. He is not a bully. He is the complete opposite of that. I, I'm absolutely shocked by those accusations, and I really hope that you can reconsider and, and see this man for who he really is by the support system here that he has. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Jessica Bailey, then Gregory Williams. Ms. Bailey, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jessica Bailey. I'm class of 2011. Um, I played uh, volleyball for Coach Malcolm. Uh, there isn't really much left to say that hasn't been said already, but I just want to say that without Coach Malk, a lot of us wouldn't be where we are today. He has given us all life lessons through teaching, coaching, and mentoring. He has been my go-to reference for college, for studying abroad, for getting a job, and even getting a job in another country. He has taught me to be diverse, to accept diversity, and to embrace diversity. He has given us family within the school and on the court and on the field. I just ask that you reconsider taking him out of the family that is Wooster High School. He has given us all so much to be proud of. He made us work for things to be proud of, and he's still there to support us in everything that we do. And he is more than a coach, more than a teacher. He is a mentor, he is a father, and he is just what Wooster High School needs to be Wooster High School. And I really, really hope that you all reconsider what you've heard today and move forward, hopefully in the right direction with keeping Mr. Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Gregory Williams. Mr. Williams, welcome. We have three minutes, sir. Um, I actually hear on behalf of my son. Uh, he's in the U.S. Air Force. He flies in a fighter jet. He graduated from Purdue University, special military honors. He asked me to be here today to tell you that Coach Milk, next to myself, was the greatest influence on his life. He spent a couple of years on the bench next to Coach. <laughs> My son asked him, Coach wanted to know if, if I wanted him to play as a sophomore. He said he wouldn't get very many at bats. I said, teach him to be a coach, because someday he will be. And that's what Melk did. And he gave my son a chance to run the computer and the new technology that they use in baseball today. And uh, I'm very proud to say that my son went on and graduated from Purdue University. And he's, he loved Coach Melk. I hope that you can consider all the good things he's done and, and all the time I was around him. And I worked closely with him fundraising. Uh, never heard him utter anything that, that seemed derogatory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. That's all I have. Okay, those are all the public comment cards we have. We do thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come out to share your thoughts and your concerns with the Washington County School District Board of Trustees. In case you aren't aware, we just want to remind you that we are unable to deliberate or consider any item that is not on the agenda. And so there is no deliberation or action for the board to even consider at this time. But during the public comment period is the time when uh, those of you that have come forward as you have uh, to share any, any comments, concerns um, that you have with the board during that time. So once again, we thank each of you for coming and for taking the time. Those of you who are here, and we have two overflow rooms from what I understand, and so we thank each and every one of you for again taking the time to be here. Before we continue with the agenda, why don't we have a, a, a quick break? We have about a 10-minute break, and we can give the, give these kind people an opportunity to uh, certainly leave if they like, and we can re, re, um, reconvene in 10 minutes. All right, everyone. Thank you for your indulgence as we had a little bit of a break and now we can turn our attention back fully to the agenda 
So we'll go right on to agenda item 1.05. This is action to adopt the agenda. So if there are no requests from my colleagues to make any, um, any changes, then I will entertain a motion to that effect at this time. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, uh, yes, Vice President Holland. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I had a note back from the staff. I had asked some questions about 4.27, and there was a suggestion that that be taken out of consent. Okay. Okay, that's, I was, you want, should we wait till we get to the consent agenda? Well, I just, I was you checking just make sure? for the language on the consent agenda item, and it, it didn't. Okay, that's it, no problem. Yeah, we can, we can remove it anytime we it want was, to. Yeah, so. Nope. So we're going to pull it from a, we're going to pull it from, from consent, consent and just not from the agenda, but not pull from, it from the consent. agenda. Just oh from yeah, consent. yeah. Typically, I just ask who wants to move something from consent. That's okay. What number is that? Four point. Four point two seven. Four point two seven. Okay. Okay. So that change will be made. We'll, we'll uh, pull that from the consent agenda. A any other requests in, in terms of uh, ag the agenda item? If if none, then I will entertain the motion to that effect at this time. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Mayor and seconded by Trustee Simon Holland that we uh, approve the agenda um, as amended. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposition? Aye. Oh, yeah, that, you're late. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. Sorry, 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 sorry uh, Trustee Franco. Gotcha. That's an aye. Gotcha. Yes, thank you. Okay, let the record show that that is unanimous. The motion passed it is unanimous. And now we will go on to agenda item number two. Did, were you raising your hand? No, I was going to take my glasses off. Oh, okay. I thought you, I was like, a, look, the legal guy starts raising his hand. It's like, what? Okay, okay. Go ahead and take your glasses off. That's fine. Okay. Agenda item number two. This is the annual reorganization of the Board of Trustees. Do we have uh, any public comment at this time to begin with? Seeing none, we will turn agenda item 2.01 over to our Chief General Counsel. So, consistent with last year, We'll open it up for nominations, close the nominations, then do a motion to uh, for one of the candidates. If the motion carries, then that person becomes the officer for that position. Are there any questions? Again, it's very similar to what we've done. Okay, seeing none, we, we begin with the office of the president, and I see I see your light on, uh, Dr. Finkler. So agenda item 2.02, .02, board nominations and election of the office of president of the board of trustees. From, of course, from among all of us who are sitting here without having to read all the names. Dr. Feimster? Oh, read all the names? No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. Just, just, you have your light on, so. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'd like to nominate someone, but prior to nominating that person, could I just give a little brief summary? Just really brief. Well, should, should we have the motion, then second, and then have a discussion? Everything. Why don't we do that? Why don't you make the nomination? We'll have the nomination second, and then it'll be open for discussion. Okay. Okay. I would nominate John Mayer for president. Okay. There's a nomination on the floor for uh, Trustee Mayer um, as president. Is there a second to the nomination? I'll second. Okay. Second the nomination. You should. Be, it's a sad dog that doesn't wag his own tail. So that's <laughs> good. <laughs> Only have a little bit more time to get these in. So I'm trying to. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> that's pretty good, though, huh? That's on the record too, huh, JJ? That's pretty good. That, that's never been said at a board meeting before. But the point of clarification? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, Trustee Frankel. Clarify. So Tr is that a motion? That, that is a motion, and we're about to go into discussion. Okay, because I understood the um, legal count, chief legal counsel saying that we did nominations first and then did the motion, but I, but I, got, I hear now that that's a motion, so thank you. Yeah. That was my recommendation, is you do the nominations, put everyone in. So oh, I'm sorry. Right. My, 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 okay, right. my mistake. So, so Ms. Trustee Mayer has been uh -huh. nominated. Mm -hmm. Are there any other nominations? Mm -hmm. Yes, I nominate such and such, or oh, maybe I, no one, okay, and then I, do a motion. Okay, I thought you had said that we just do it and just go one by one. Not on on the motion, but not on the nomination. No, gotcha. Yeah. Thank, you for the, for, thank you for the clarification, Trustee Frankel. And I'd like to nominate um, Trustee Simon Holland. Okay, thank you very much. We have a, the nomination of Trustee Simon Holland. Do we, we second the nomination? Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, second to that nomination. Are there any other nominations for the Office of President? Okay, seeing none, then we will have a discussion right. on those. And now back to you, as promised, Dr. Finkster. Okay. Um, I 
I feel that the role of the president, school board president, and part, in partnership with the um, school board superintendent is extremely, extremely important to the entire district. It is, it's like golden. Everything starts at the top. Uh, it's important that, uh, let me maybe give a, a scenario. Uh, in the Catholic Church, when you are ready to be married, or when you think you're ready to be married, you go uh, to a, uh, a program uh, with the priest, and it lasts for a period of time, I think six months. I don't know how long, but six months. And the priest is then ready to tell you whether he feels you are ready to be married uh, because of all the different things that um, he has spoken about with you uh, as a singleton and then with you as your and your partner and um, that it's it's a marriage so I look at this as a marriage and it is so important that that marriage at the top is sets the tone for the entire district just as mother and father sets the tone for the family and just in listening to all the speakers that we had earlier for the coach you heard words like relationship trust friendship respect um, all these things are so important loyalty um, sticking up for the kids and I I'm I see where oh life lessons all of this is so important for that entire team to work and yet these kids are still coming back for support for um, uh, acknowledgement for uh, just life lessons Having said that, I think it's so important, again, for the superintendent and the board president to set the tone for the district because they're at the top. Uh, trees die from the top down, whether we believe it or not. They die from the top down. You may look around in the middle and see some things that you want to pull out, some leaves that you want to pull out, but they die from the top down because you can still see it a root of a tree and it will pop back up any day haven't been in hurricanes I could guarantee that and I'm not much of a science person but I'm going I want to look at mr. mayor because he has had experience um, he does have a great rapport with um, the superintendent and I want to be on that team for just that just one more year um, I I mean one more year is not going to hurt us I don't, I don't think um, I'd rather see us grow and do because I feel like I just started yesterday so a year is just gonna go by like this I feel that we could all learn a bit more especially those of us who have just uh, been on the board for this past year if we had the time to sit back and observe um, another year of um, uh, the superintendent as she works with someone you guys work together before you guys work together before it sure. yeah because okay they work together as um, uh, were you the president okay all right, that team that team was in place once before and it was successful. Um, in order to continue success, I think one of the best things that we could do is just move this into one more year, um, and um, knowing that they're not going to be any uh, 
problems with uh, with relationships, any problems with respect, any problem. Not that they're there. Do not, because I don't know. I just feel the camaraderie more um, between Mr. Mayor and um, uh, the su Superintendent Davis, and that's my personal opinion. I want to be on a winning team. I want to observe. I want to observe another year and see how how other members might rise into the position. I also know that um, people in our district are already, you hear people saying, oh, our climate is this, our climate is that. I got to tell you, the first thing that our employees are going to do is observe the relationship between the superintendent and the board president. And if it starts to decline, if, even if it looks, has a hint of uh, decline, it's going to get blown up. I, I could go down the line and give you every school board member for the past 30 years, school board members as president who more or less contributed to a negative school district climate. It's stuff that happens, and if you don't believe it, read the literature. So I would hope that you would just consider that, and the, Katie, I'd be the first one saying, oh yes, next year, oh yes, I think Katie's ready, I think that's great, but I just want to, uh, I mean, I've been with the district for 30 years, and I still want to observe, so it's just um, my personal opinion, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Finkster. Any other discussion? I'm giving the moment to pause to make sure I don't, don't uh, exclude Trustee Frankel. Okay, seeing none, now I will entertain the motion. Right, that'll be appropriate at this time. So now, Dr. Freemstar, I'll go back, go back to you because I, you thought you made the motion before and it really needed to be just getting nominations. Now I'll go back to you for a motion. I'd like to nominate uh, a motion to nominate uh, John Mayer as president for one year. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there a second to that motion? All second. Okay. Has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none. Um, hearing none. All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. Madam President. Yes. I'd yes. Like a roll call vote. You would like a roll call vote? Okay. Absolutely. Why, why don't we roll call vote? Please, if you would, Ms. Batchelder. You bet, Trustee Mayor. Deborah Feimster. Yay. Yay. Veronica Frankel. No. Katie Simon Holland. No. Scott Kelly. No. John Mayer. Yes, absolutely. Melina Raymond. No. Angela Taylor. Yes. The motion fails. Okay, the motion fails. I look for an, another nomination at this time. We already have a nomination. We already have yeah. it, so is there so we go ahead and just go with that. We don't need a new reno. So need, I'm sorry, not a nomination, a motion. Look for another motion at the you, you think I've done this a couple times before, believe it or not. Uh, then, uh, so we have another motion. I'm looking to you. Uh, your lights on, Trustee Kelly. Sure. Um, I nominate Katie Simon Holland to be president of the school board for one year. Okay. Thank you, Clerk Kelly. Is there I a second? second that motion. There is a second to that motion. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none. Roll call vote once again. Deborah Feimster. No. Veronica Frankel. Yes. Katie Simon Holland? Yes. Scott Kelly? Yes. John Mayer? Absolutely no. Melina Raymond? Yes. Angela Taylor? Yes. The motion passes. The motion passes. The motion passes. Okay. Congratulations. Trustee, I guess I can say, still say Trustee Simon Holland. We'll move on to agenda item 2.03. This is nominations and election. The Office of Vice President, let me see if I can get this one right. This is open for nominations. Any nominations for the Office of Vice President? 
I'd, yes, like, I'd like to nominate Trustee Melana Raymond. Okay, thank you, Trustee Franco. There's a nomination. Second. The second to that nomination. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Okay, seeing none, the nominations are closed, and then we will entertain the motion at this time. Move to uh, move for Melina Raymond to be vice president of the board. Thank you, President Elect Simon okay. Holland. Oh, president, president now. Yes, is there is there there's a move? Is there a second? Veronica. Oh, Veronica did that. Did I miss you? Second. Okay, thank you, Trustee Franco. I'm sorry about that. There's a second. Okay, let's have a roll, roll call a roll call vote for this as well, Ms. Batchelder, please. Deborah Feimster. Absolutely, yes. Veronica Frankel. Yes. Katie Simon Holland. Yes. Scott Kelly. Yes. John Mayer. Yes. Melina Raymond. Yes. Angela Taylor. Yes. The motion passes. The motion passes. The record show it is unanimous. Con unanimous. Congratulations. And then we'll go right down to agenda item 2.04. This is board nominations and election for the office of the board clerk. And I will open up nominations at this time. Yes, Trustee I would like Malina. to nominate John Mayer. Okay, we have a nomination. Is there a second? Second. Yes, nominated and seconded. Nominated by, by uh, Vice President Raymond and President Simon Holland. Any other nominations from the floor at this time? Okay, hearing none, nominations are closed, and now we will entertain the motion. I move to have John Mayer be the clerk for the school board. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by trustee, by Vice President Raymond and seconded by President Simon Holland. Um, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. Okay, all those opposed? <laughs> okay, the motion is carried. Let the record show it is uh, unanimous. And now we will, first of all, before we'll, the, it's typical, it's traditional on the board, now we have all resituate and we'll see how the, the new president wants to align us. I just want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues um, for, the, for the time that, I, that you um, allowed me the honor of serving as president of this esteemed body. Um, it's, it's been a tremendous honor for me. I thank you for your support. I thank you for your questions. I thank you for all of that. And let's just go ahead and continue and go to the next level. So thank you so much. And I cer certainly want to thank you for your support during the time when I was, wasn't here a lot. You, you stepped in tremendously. All of you did. You reached out. Um, you cared for me. And it really, really made me feel good. So thank you so much. Okay, so we'll have thank a quick you. break. Thank you. And uh, Angie, I know uh, all of us would share in the thought that you have provided tremendous leadership to us uh, in a difficult time. Uh, you always have a, a good vision, a sense of humor. Uh, great support for each of us, and uh, I just I just personally want to thank you for that. And uh, you have very big shoes to fill, and um, I will do my very best to, to try to emulate the leadership that you've provided. Well, thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that. So let's have a, just a quick break, and we can resituate and go through the agenda. Quick recess. We will reconvene as the Board of Trustees for Wasser County School District, and uh, we are absent Mr. Mayor at the moment, but we are searching for him. And I just want to thank my colleagues for the honor of, uh, of electing me. Thank you. We will go on then to item three, which are uh, reports. Uh, 3.01 is board reports. Yeah, but you didn't, so it's on. And uh, why don't we start with you, Trustee Taylor? <laughs> Well, this is our first meeting since the break, so the only thing I have to report is, oh, we got to go do the, the groundbreaking the, for the new school Sky Ranch. Sky, Sky, Sky Ranch, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I, that was my first opening. You guys got to have one earlier in the year. I missed that one, so I was like a little kid in a toy shop. I had a, had a great time, and they did a tremendous event. They did, they did a tremendous thing. They had you know, food there and so on. It was fantastic, so... I'm excited about what's to come as we build more schools. All right, uh, Trustee Kelly. I'll pass. Trustee Feimster, any board reports? I'll pass. Welcome back. Any board reports? 
Okay. Uh, Vice President Raymond. Nothing to report. Thank you. Okay. And Trustee Frankel, do you have anything you'd like to add for board reports? Uh, just, just one small thing. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the Wooster IB graduation with uh, uh, Trustee Mayor, and it's, as always, a wonderful opportunity to see the incredible work that's being done there and how incredibly impressive our students are. So I could get into a lot of detail, but I won't, but I just wanted to mention that. And congratulations to all the officers. Thank you, Trustee Frankel. And I just wanted to add um, what a wonderful night it was last night at the Martin Luther King dinner. And uh, thank you, Tiffany Young, the president of Northern Nevada Black Cultural Awareness Society, who did a wonderful job. Uh, and we are all so proud of Trustee Angela Taylor for being inducted into the Hall of Fame for the Northern Nevada Black Cultural Awareness Society. Thank you. a richly deserved honor as one of the founders of the Northern Nevada Black Cultural Awareness Society. And it's amazing that you founded that 30 years ago when you were only nine. So <laughs> you know, I've a child prodigy. <laughs> you know, I've always been ahead of my time, so. Absolutely, absolutely. So we are not worthy, so thank you. Okay, uh, we will move on to superintendent's report. Superintendent Davis. So I'll just add last night, I wanna say thank you to Tiffany for the children, the students of Washoe County yes. School District. I'm sitting at the table and I know Kristen was dialoguing, we were asking questions and so it was great to see how sharp they were greeting and escorting people in and articulate. So thank you for garnering student support um, of that event and it was wonderful as usual and of course, um, Trustee Taylor, we found a few lashes. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a lot because it has been Christmas break and I trust that everyone had a wonderful break, but I'll just say today we learned in Business Insiders that um, Washoe County School District by independent people, not us doing this work um, throughout the country, the nation uses a tool and Washoe County School District was voted number one in the state of Nevada. They identify the number one districts in every state. And so I wanna say thank you to the 8,000 employees that come to work every day and that is the reason why we are number one and we hope to continue our journey. You know, we're, we're better than we were yesterday and we hope to continue and so that's really good for our staff. And congratulations to you for your leadership of the district. Uh, that is a huge honor and I know the uh, the staff is gonna make a lot of PR uh, uh, from that, so it's great. Thank you and congratulations to all the staff for that great honor. Okay, let's go on to the consent agenda items uh, in four and we did take item 4.27 out of the uh, consent agenda. Is there anything else that people want to take out of consent? I know uh, Trustee Frankel, I believe you had some things you wanted to take out of consent. Yes, I wanted the opportunity for us to talk a little bit just so I could get clarification on, and actually so we could discuss it before the public on 4.19, 4.20, 4.21, they're related and similar. And then I also had some questions about 4.22 and again wanted to have that discussed um, more transparently um, in front of the public. Okay, uh, do you want staff to speak about them uh, before or do you want to actually pull them out of consent? Uh, again, I mean, I have some questions about um, about the association of the design cost to construction costs, and just wanted to talk about that. They can, if they can speak before we vote on them, if, if the whole block of consent, that's fine. Um, I did kind of want to pull out 4.22 just because I have some more questions about uh, again the cost um, and just some confusion I have about. Um, about the design work and whether it's being built off previous design work and why it costs so much. I just wanted to have more clarification on that. Okay, well let's let's go ahead and we'll pull those out of consent then. So um, we would be voting on uh, the consent agenda with the exception of 4.19, 4.20, 4.21, 4.22, and 4.27. And I do want to acknowledge uh, the staff turned around very quickly some questions that we had on the agenda that I had, and I very much appreciate the effort everybody <coughs> made uh, this morning to get those questions answered, so all of my questions um, were resolved. So do we have a motion to approve uh, as uh, amended? So move. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, and I would call for public comment. Is there any public comment on any of the uh, any of the consent agenda items? And any other discussion? 
Seeing none, uh, we have a motion by uh, Trustee Taylor and a second by Trustee Kelly. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, great. Motion passes. Thank you very M much. Madam President, if yes. I may, sh should we just, as, as customary, make sure those the que answers to your questions are entered into the record? Yes, that's fine. That's Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Taylor. Okay, let's go to uh, item 4.19. Gentle Joe Gabika, and thank you. I did. Uh, I did get some great answers to these. Uh, Trustee Frankel, do you want to ask your questions? Yeah, actually, um, I asked my questions before I received the answers um, that they had wrapped because I asked. This, I think very similar questions to yours. I submitted some questions this morning as well on a number of agenda items, and this on um, these four items, or at least three, 19, 20, and 21. I, and I appreciated the response I saw to your question, but I did want it sort of on the record, kind of how we understand why design costs go up when construction costs go up, and that immediate association based on a percentage. Because I, I just, I want to understand that more, because it's, we had the design costs already identified, and I know that there was an explanation provided in the answer, but I'd like to just have that on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gabika, go ahead. Thank you, President Holland, uh, members of the board, and Superintendent Davis. Again, for the record, I'm Joe Gabika, Interim Chief Facilities Officer. Probably the best way to explain this, and it really is in the way of an explanation, is to provide you with some history um, and how architectural engineering team services are secured. Um, Back in August of 2016, uh, anticipating that WC1 would hopefully pass, we started at that time talking to uh, both the architects that had been selected in, under prior RFQ for both the elementary school and the middle school. And I'm going to separate the two just because it's a little simpler. We first went to the architectural uh, team of H&K Architects, who was the one selected for the elementary school. And I asked them for a level of effort proposal. When you, so, when you get architectural services, there's two ways to do it. Now, first way is just level of effort. Second way is a percentage of construction cost. Level of effort involves a lot of work for the firm to do, but they were willing to do it. And what they do is they get together with their subconsultant team, and they basically sit down and estimate, based on prior experience of, of buildings of similar size and scope, what it's going to take to put together the drawings and specifications, excuse me, through schematic design, design development, um, construction documents, bidding, and ultimately uh, construction administration. That firm came back at that time on August 16th with a level of effort proposal in the amount of two thousand, or I'm sorry, two million four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, at that time, as you might recall, we were looking at what we thought the cost of that elementary school to be, which was $23 million. That, if you look at just the, do the math on that, that puts you a percentage of well above 10%, which to me was exorbitant. I couldn't really agree with that. So I met with them and said, okay, uh, guys, what about a percentage of, of construction cost proposal? I consulted with the State Nevada Public Works Board, excuse me, my predecessor, Mr. Dale Sanderson, who had done this for the last 30 years and said, okay, what are the kind of percentages we should be looking at for something like this? And Dale and the Public Works Board both said that for a building of this scope and size, you could expect a proposal between 8 and 10% for a prototype design. It would be less for a site adapt after that. So that's really where we started, and we negotiated basically an 8.1% fee for the 23 million, which was the proposal I brought forward to you before and you approved it. The architect did, the architectural firm did reserve the right, however, because they felt that it was going to cost more than 23 million to renegotiate once we knew closer what those costs would be. And that is in the contract, that those terms are in the contract. So time went by, we got our CMAR on board, we got our independent cost estimating firm on board, and they've done an estimate on what it's going to take to build these buildings, and it's substantially more than this $23 million. It's $31 million. So immediately they came to me and said, well, Joe, we knew this was going to happen. We talked to you early on about this. 
and now it's here, and we would like to renegotiate the contract. So we went through the process, and basically that's what the adder is for. For all intents and purposes, the design team is running out of money at this point, and we're not close to being done, okay, just due to the level of effort that they're doing. If you add the percentage of construction cost fees together, it's basically 2,511,000, $2, which is slightly more than the level of effort proposal that they gave us well over, you know, a uh, year and a half ago. So it's pretty close to what they thought it might be. So it, it kind of lends some credence that their level of effort proposal that they gave me initially was not far off. Now with the middle school architects, it's a little bit different case because we had the DePoli Middle School that was kind of our, you know, I wouldn't say it's our prototype because there have been some pretty significant changes to that building with what we're building now, but at least it was uh, a benchmark, right? So. Going into that one, I was not at all willing to negotiate an 80% contract with them. I said, you know, guys, you, there's a lot of, that you can reuse from before, so you need to be able to sharpen your pencil on that. So at that time, for the first of those schools, for the prototype, if you will, we negotiated a 6.9% contract. Since then, obviously, the costs have come in. That, that was based upon a $55 million uh, construction cost. Now the cost of that school is 73 million and same kind of thing. Their, um, their team has been working diligently uh, on basically an accelerated schedule to get this thing put together and they're running out of fees and they also reserve the right to come back and negotiate that fee. Now in this case I, I, I met with them and I said okay had I known, however, that it was going to be 73 million and not 55 million, I would not have agreed to the 6.9 percent. It should have been less than that. And at first, they didn't necessarily agree, and we kind of bantered back and forth. And so I've negotiated that one down to a 5.9 percent fee for the prototype. The second of the two, the Spanish Springs Middle School, was originally negotiated as a site adapt fee at 4.9 percent. Now we've negotiated that one down to 4.2%, which is also kind of in a separate note on, uh, on item 4. Uh, let's see, 2.2. That's the percentage we use to negotiate with them for the Air Creek School as well, the 4.2% fee, because that is uh, also a site adapt of the Sun Valley plan. So, you know, I've been doing this way too long now. Uh, built 40 schools. Uh, and support facilities for the school district. I've negotiated a lot of these contracts, and um, it, it's, it's a difficult negotiation to do. On the one hand, we want to be fair. On the other hand, we don't want to pay more than we feel we need to. I'm bringing these forward to you because I think it's the fair thing to do. Um, these gentlemen, or these teams, men and women, have worked very hard, and we've had an accelerated schedule. We're asking them to take on a great deal more design liability because of these uh, estimates, and I feel that they're due these fees. Otherwise, I wouldn't be bringing them forward to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Frankel, do you have uh, other questions about those items? Well, just about 4.22, and, uh, and you mentioned the site adapt cost, and I guess that the one thing I want to understand is the 4.3% Consistent because I, I think I'm, I'm not understanding the amount of money that we spent for previous designs and prototypes, and we're building off the Dipoli quote prototype and changing it to kind of Dipoli 2.0 for Spanish Springs and Sun Valley Middle School. And so when we have to pay three million for an additional design for a new middle school that's going to be built off of those modified prototypes, I just need to understand what additional costs go into that $3 million if we already have a base design. So I think that's where my question is just wanting to understand what those additional costs are and why 4.3, if 4.3% is reasonable. And I'm in no way um, not appreciating the, the history and the experience that staff had. I just need to understand it, and I think the public might have questions about that as well. I think that's a fair question. Um, 4.2% for, uh, 4 for a cited at fee is actually quite low. Uh, as you might recall, during the 80s and 90s, we built 23 middle schools of basically a very similar design. At that time, the cited app fee for those was 5%. Uh, so, and again, I felt that that was too high because this is a, a, excuse me, significantly larger building. 
and so I felt that that percentage should be lower. Um, and so that's why I negotiated it down to the 4.2%, which again is the same fee as the Spanish Springs Middle School because the Spanish Springs Middle School is also a site adapt. In this case, our prototype is the Sun Valley School. That was the first one we came out of the shoot with, and that one had the higher fee. So the 4.2% is consistent at Spanish Springs. It's also consistent with uh, what we're planning to do out at Arrow Creek. Um, but the 4.2% this time is based upon an estimate of 73 million as opposed to 55 million, which, uh, do the math there, comes out to the 3 uh, million 66,000. So that's how that fee was arrived upon. Um, the uh, site at Arrow Creek is going to be every bit as challenging, if not more challenging, than Sun Valley. The topography is much the same. It's very steep. Uh, it's got a, we're finding out it has a series of uh, faults, earthquake faults through it that we're going to need to avoid. Uh, it's got some traffic issues and some other things that we need to work around. It's a great site. We're um, well on our way of getting that site for a very low cost through the uh, Forest Service. Uh, it's located in, in, in the right location, so uh, there are architectural and engineering ways to surmount these problems, but it's not without a great deal of work on the architectural engineering team. Um, and initially they wanted more money than the 4.2, but I was unwilling to go anymore, and because we had agreed on that amount at Spanish Springs, I kind of drew a line in the sand there, and they were ultimately comfortable with that, so that's why we're here today. However, that being said, the, the contract amount that we're looking for today is for the total scope of services. But we will be giving them a letter of authorization based upon the direction from the Capital Funding Protection Committee as well as the board to not go beyond schematic design. When they get to the end of the schematic design, unless they've gotten an authorization from us to proceed beyond that, they will have to stop. So, um, and I think the, the schematic design portion of that is usually somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, so at this time probably would only be spending roughly $600,000 plus or minus of that funds. I hope that answers the question, Trustee Franco. It does, it does, and I appreciate you taking the time to explain it, and uh, I very much appreciate the amount of time you're spending on all these negotiations. I know it's a lot of work, and I appreciate your expertise and experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Joe, for explaining that issue about the schematic, proceed through schematic design. I thank you for putting that on the record, because that was a concern. Uh, it's, it sounds like it's $3 million just to get through schematic design, but it's for the entire the entire design. Great. Are there other questions from board members? There's no question, just a, a comment. I, I, I'm glad you pulled this, Trustee Franco, in that it's good to get on the record that as construction costs go up, the cost of those other ancillary um, parts of the project go up as well. So it's not as though we're just throwing money out there, but it's because it is a percentage, and it sounds like you negotiated down to, you know, to a pretty good level. I try. Great. Any other questions? So, is there uh, is there an appetite on the board to uh, to approve 4.19, 4.20, 4.21, 4 and 4.22 altogether? Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Frankel. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Feimster. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, and thank you, Joe, and thanks to the team. These are huge milestones uh, in moving our district forward on these building projects, so um, very exciting. And uh, we also thank the architects for their work on this and for being cooperative with your grinding them down in the negotiations, so thanks for that. Okay, uh, we have uh, also item 4.27 uh, that was requested to take out of consent, and this uh, is Authorization to submit the 2017-2018 Washoe County School District Performance Plan to improve student achievement to the Nevada Department of Education in accordance with Title I, Part A funding requirements. Uh, and Ben Hayes is here, Chief Accountability Officer. Good afternoon, uh, President Simon Holland and Superintendent Davis and trustees. Uh, again, for the record, Ben Hayes, Chief Accountability Officer, 
Uh, with me is our Chief Academic Officer, Deborah Byersdorf, and our Title I Director, Brian Pruitt. Uh, there, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Just for a quick, by way of background, I think there was some concern from the trustees that we weren't presenting the, DP, the district performance plan um, a, and it, it was on consent. The reason for that in the background, that it's not really our guiding documents, kind of a um, subset of the strategic plan itself. So a, anything in there is kind of a subset that we're already covering in the strategic plan. Um, background on the document itself, in 2013, we were required by the state to uh, to do an, a, what they call a curriculum audit for the district. Uh, and we went through that process and did a big needs assessment. And that's how we came up with uh, two goals that you see in the district performance plan. And those, are, uh, those were built kind of with uh, Envision 2020 in mind uh, and knowing that we had the new Nevada academic content standards, uh, new testing, and, and the like. So we built those goals. It was one around curriculum materials and implementing the curriculum uh, in, in accordance with the new standards and one around professional learning. So that is where you see a lot of the, um, the professional learning and kind of curricular uh, activities that we have now through professional learning. Um, but again, the strategic plan itself is our guiding document, of course, and has the, the one-pagers that you're used to seeing and the project plans behind them. So anything in the district um, performance plan is uh, not as built out and designed as in the strategic plan. So I apologize for not being clear on that in the board report. Um, this is uh, more of a procedural thing at this point. The, it's Timing wise, the district performance plan has never worked out um, to be a guiding document for us in the year to year because it's due January 30th. We go through, you, you, the trustees do a budget cycle every year beginning uh, this year earlier than ever, but typically in February, March. Uh, and we go through the monitoring of the strategic plan and the district performance plan usually is kind of a, aligned with that and is, uses a lot of the language and the actions from the strategic plan. So that's what this uh, district performance plan, one of the reasons we're hesitant to, to make too many changes to this, we're still implementing the curriculum. Uh, we still monitor that again through the strategic plan, but the state has said that they want to change the district performance plan process next year. They haven't exactly told us how yet, um, but they want to make it a coherent. We have a district performance plan and we have kind of these grants that you can apply for and we have this monitoring system from the state. So they want to make that all a new process and a, and a more aligned and coherent process next year. So as they do that, we'll kind of realign with the strategic plan, how that's Dr. McNeil is already working with us, direct reports on some of the strategic plan objectives that the trustees recommended a few months ago. Uh, and that'll find its way into the new district performance plan process. And we'll probably have to do some new needs assessment work over the summer, which is a great thing um, as we're already kind of working on the strategic plan. So, um, and there are Title I implications of, we, this is a procedural thing and it's something that we must do for Title I. So Brian's here to answer any questions um, or if you want to tell a few implications of Title I funding and why we must, what that implies for the district performance plan. Good evening. So one of the things, and Ben already alluded to this, is this is a state requirement. And so um, just a brief history. So about before five years ago, what the state used to let us do is submit the strategic plan as our DPP, right? And that's what counted those requirements. And so they changed that in 2013 and came up with this NCAT and had a separate document that would meet those requirements. And so for Title I, what we have to ensure with this document is that Title I funding is aligned to the district goals while also meeting the Title I requirements such as school improvement, family engagement, um, low poverty schools, how we target our schools, and all of that is identified in this plan. Deborah, do you want to add anything? Well, I'll, I'll add maybe just a little bit more. Um, you, they, you guys did a great deal. So, uh, good job. Um, so President um, Simon Holland and Superintendent Davis, members of the board. So we've been um, waiting for direction from uh, NDE regarding the plan, the template that would be used this year in the submission date as well. So we've been very aware that this was something that we needed to do. We got word 
just I want to say a little bit after Thanksgiving, um, we brought together um, a team of folks. You see many of the names on the front page of the um, draft plan that's in front of you um, or that was sent to you last week. Um, and we, we met for about two hours um, the week before the holiday break to update language as needed. Some department names had changed. Um, there was also some wording that we changed around high school proficiency exams to EOCs and that. So it's a current document, um, and it's one in the Office of Academics that definitely drives the work that we're doing. Um, uh, in the near future, we'll come uh, forward with you for new um, material adoption. So we're better aligned in our materials and uh, secondary math um, to uh, Nevada academic content standards. So it is work that's um, going ahead. And now that I get to work with Brian as well um, in Title I, um, just as Brian said as well, it's a document that has to ensure that we're doing our due diligence around those Title I requirements such as family engagement and helping our um, lower performing schools. Any, any questions? Uh, Trustee Kelly. Yeah, I just had a, a timeline question. Um, help me understand, so the, the school year starts the you know, beginning of August, and the state requires that this, that this plan be submitted to them um, at, at the end of the year, or beginning of this year. So why, do you know why they, make, why they want it to be then? Like why would ha almost half the school year be over before they receive our performance plans? Like, what's the thinking on, on their end that you know of, like, why the timeline that they've set is set that way? I think a lot of it had to do with the legislative process. School performance plans are due a certain date, and then the district performance plan to align with that um, was aligned to those those dates as well. And it's never, like I said, and it's a, it's a great point, it just doesn't lead itself to, or lend itself to kind of a, a driving process. So I think that that's uh, largely the reason that they're doing the redesign next year to make it. They've already changed some of the legislation to make uh, school performance plans due earlier in the year, and I think that's their thinking behind this. Clerk Mayor. So I have a question on uh, Common Core evaluation. Uh, some of the school board members throughout the state are finding that to be difficult because they really don't have any guidelines on Common Core curriculum as yet to evaluate. Uh, and they're having a real hard time putting that in the plan. Is our Common Core evaluation plan in part of this? Just for clarification, Trustee Mayor, um, again, Deborah Byersdorf, are, are you meaning evaluation for um, personnel, teachers, or for school performance plans? Or? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, what they're having trouble with is putting in the courses that are covered by Common Core that don't, don't have the guidelines fixed yet. So I think we want to talk about Nevada content academic right. standards. Like, let, let's lead the conversation right. to. Um, we've we've done a um, a very heavy lift around um, Nevada Nevada academic NVAX as we say um, with mathematics and ELA. Um, new social studies standards rolled out this year from the state um, and within our our CNI office RPDP. Other offices as well were out training teachers, training um, administrators to be able to look for evidence of um, uh, common core academic standards in the classroom. Um, science is a, another area. Um, you saw one of the, your, your consent items today was uh, FOSS kits for um, our elementary, so we're doing a lot of work around science as well. Um, we're doing a lot of work at the secondary level, um, changes um, with EOCs from HSPEs and as we're preparing for ACT. So, so I, we, we can do a better job and we continue to do so, but there are changes that are coming from Nevada Department of Ed around um, s changes to, to standards. So I think social studies is a good example with new rollout this year. But what I'm talking about is their whole being held accountable for like social studies and mm -hmm. some of these, and they don't have the guidelines yet. Uh, and, you know, here it is, January. And, yes. Uh, they don't. They didn't have the yes. guidelines to start the curriculum in. in uh, yes. September. Yes. Yes. And they're finding it very, very mm -hmm. difficult. 
and it's nothing against you guys. Right. It's it's the uh, haste makes waste right. type thing with the Department of Education, right. Right. not releasing those guidelines. Right. And so I, I'd hate us to get knocked down on not evaluating right. Common mm -hmm. Core because of the lack of uh, mm -hmm. guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, and you're kind of saying that, mm -hmm. that uh, you don't have anything to evaluate. Yeah, we're, we're what, is, what is the saying? We're building it as it's, as it's flying, and that's true in some cases. I will, I will assure you, though, that um, staff from our curriculum and instruction department, from uh, Northwest RPDP, from Ben, from your area as well, assessment area, are very involved in the work that's happening in Carson. As a matter of fact, I think there's a state board meeting a little later this week as well. So we, and we're also fortunate in Washoe too that we do have um, robust department help that's going out to schools as well. So yes. So you're, yes. you're just I, beginning the process really because of the lack of guidelines really. We, um, I don't know if beginning is, but we are we are well into it as best as we can with the guidance that we have. <laughs> you're, you're playing on the hope that that's what's going to be. Y yes, yes. And, yeah, and, and the you work, know, mm -hmm. small districts they can't they can't do that. I know. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if the evaluation process is going to be the same. Mm -hmm for us as it is the small counties mm -hmm. and we don't get docked mm -hmm. the funds that they owe us mm -hmm. so they'll say well these mm -hmm. is the fines mm -hmm. you know or whatever mm -hmm. are there other questions I just wanted to add how valuable the report was for me um, there are so many uh, points made in the findings about primary grades and in intermediate grades and it's the kind of thing that I think the board benefits from hearing how we're doing uh, on student achievement as regularly as you all can bring that to us because we all, you know, we all want to be supportive of that. So I appreciated uh, some of those findings and, and, you know, elementary reading performance has climbed steadily since 2011. You know, those are wonderful findings for us to know about as well as some of the challenges that we have. So. Um, so thanks for sharing that information and, and just always, for me at least, as one trustee in the future, when you can share that information with us, the successes and the challenges, it's really great for us to know about that. So thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else? Trustee Frankel, anything from you? Yes. I'll just echo what you said, President Simon Holland. Um, and uh, the findings were very informative and helpful and I think I'm glad to hear that there's discussion around the objectives in the strategic plan because I think having this information before discussing future objectives or adding to those objectives I think is very important because it gives us some ideas of where we're doing well and where we can focus for some additional goals and objectives. Great. Okay. Anything else? Ben, you want to add any last comments? Uh, I would just be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to plug the data summit coming up in a, in a month where we'll talk about a lot of this and then um, please check out WCSDdata.net for a lot of these results as well. And legal counsel reminds us that shameless plug was not on our agenda. But thank you very much, <laughs> Chief Accountability Officer Hayes. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, really grateful for the great work you all did. I also want to thank all of the folks who served on the preparation of this plan. That was an amazing group of folks, both within the district and outside. And we are super grateful uh, for all the time that everybody put in. So thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see, do we need to take action? Yes, we, I need a motion to uh, authorize to submit that uh, district performance plan. So move. Thank you, Trustee Taylor. Is there a second? Second. Vice President Raymond second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, great, thank you. That motion passes unanimously. All right, we will go on to our budget items, and our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Mark Mathers, is here. And uh, please introduce item 5.01, approval for your contract to provide professional consultant services and software subscription for a priority-based budgeting system to resource exploration, resource X, in the amount of $125,000, and approve the transfer of $50,000 from the general fund contingency account to cover the first year's work to include implementation. Mr. Mathers. Thank you, uh, President Simon Holland and Board of Trustees. <clears throat> Last month, you'll remember, we talked about different budgeting approaches 
<clears throat> including priority-based budgeting. We are excited to be on that path. Um, we, I don't like to overpromise, but I think it's going to be truly transformative for the district. Um, so this contract in front of you is to engage the uh, what was formerly known as the Center for Priority-Based Budgeting, now, nor, now known as Resource X, to help guide and train Washoe County School District management in the priority-based budgeting process. It also allows us to utilize their software, which allows us to model different scenarios, look at different issues um, on a go-forward basis. And so part of thinking there is to, again, we'll go through this process in the first year, and then we'll refine it the second year, and then we'll keep refining it in the third year and the fourth year, and hopefully continue to see um, benefits uh, from doing that. So uh, just as background, we did look at different options for how we might um, go forward on priority-based budgeting system, including, as you saw in the staff report, doing this internally. But based on our review of who has done this and our own internal resources, we kind of wholeheartedly recommend engaging with the Center for, for Priority-Based Budgeting. We think, although you know it's not cheap by any stretch, um, this will provide uh, benefit multifold compared to the cost of the service. So with that, I'll end my presentation and open it up for questions. Any questions, Trustee Taylor? It, it defined, thank you, President Holland. Um, what, what, when it says fiscal health, I know that isn't something that we've put a check mark by in terms of what we like, but what, what kind of analysis does, that, does something like this do in terms of fiscal health? Do you know? They um, have a module that provides, it's probably more for smaller agencies, but a sense of, you know, where their fund balance stands and, you know, whether they have a structurally balanced budget and kind of gives them a report card, a scorecard on, on their financial soundness. Thank you. Other questions? Trustee Frankel, any questions from you? Uh, only that I'm very excited about this, and I think it's very important. I love the question, what matters most for success of the organization and for our students, and I think this is a great, um, a great step toward helping us make some tough decisions. That's great. And, uh, Mark, I would ask, are there other school districts that are doing priority-based budgeting? We would be the first school district in the nation to, yes, to engage the Center for Priority-Based Budgeting in a PBB process. So we will be definitely treading new water, which is something we've talked to them about, and the need for them to also, you know, dig into it, roll up their sleeves, work with us on um, doing this for the first time in a school district setting. So, yeah, it's exciting, it but we exciting. will be the first. Very exciting. Do they have any of their personnel that have any educational experience, any school district yeah, experience? Yeah, not, not to my knowledge. They um, do have city and county backgrounds, as you, as you may know. Um, they focused on city and county governments. They started with one school district in Colorado, but from unforeseen circumstances, that school district paused in what they were doing. Um, so, no, unfortunately, they, they do not, as far as I know. Have you reached out to that uh, district in Colorado just? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it had to do with the curriculum and um, kind of creationism, you know, evolution okay. issues, and their, their board kind of got slate-like gotcha. like clean, and so it had nothing to do with the <laughs> priority-based budgeting. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Not on the agenda, <laughs> yeah, we'll just stop there. Um, but I, I do, I am a huge supporter of priority-based budgeting, and I also know that it is very difficult, and it's very difficult for an organization. So uh, I, I look forward to um, all of our journey forward with this, and, um, and I, I agree it's, it's, it's going to be a challenging process, but I think it will be really good for us. Um, I am a little bit concerned that they have no school district experience, and uh, might want to encourage them to see if they can have someone with school district finance experience added to their team. And I also wanted to share, and I've mentioned to, to Mark and to others, that the, the co-founder of Priority Based Budgeting, the two founders were Chris Fabian and John Johnson. 
uh, and Chris is one of the signatories to the to the contract. John Johnson now works for me <laughs> as in uh, my capacity as the interim president of uh, the Alliance for Innovation, and he's the chief financial officer and has offered his help uh, to us as well to help us navigate through this. So. Um, I, I think it's a great thing to be bringing it forward, and I also really respect when staff says, ah, <laughs> this is really challenging, that we will, we will all be committed to listening to that and to supporting all of you and having patience with this process. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for bringing it forward. Um, is there any public comment on this item? I don't see any public comment. Okay. We don't see any public. We don't see any public, but that doesn't mean they aren't somewhere in the building. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm looking for a motion uh, to approve that contract 5.01 and to transfer $50,000 from the general fund contingency account. So moved. Thank you, Trustee Kelly. Second. Second by Vice President Raymond. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mark. Very exciting. Okay, that takes us to our closing items. Do we have any future agenda item requests from any board members? Madam President? Yes, go ahead, Trustee Frankel. Yes, I'd like to um, ask that we have um, a presentation and an opportunity to look at some of the decisions we made regarding multi-track year-round and some of the status of overcrowding in a number of the schools that we addressed in the last several years, including schools like Westergaard and Brown, as well as the schools that are on currently multi-track year-round, to explore the calendaring opportunities we have and how we're doing. Staff, is that clear? Does everybody understand what's requested there? Great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Trustee Frankel. Trustee Feimster. Yes, I would like to uh, possibly get it, get some sort of an agenda of uh, what types of uh, training, uh, particularly cultural diversity training, that we're doing for uh, a schedule of some sort for coaches, for teachers. And I, I know it's out there. I know it's happening, but I feel that we have to be able to show something so that we don't hear this stuff because this is going to eat up a lot of our time, especially what's going on in this, you know, in the United States today. I think it's important to maybe move this up, make it a priority and do something, have something in writing. So just to take a look at it, I think is uh, prudent. We Thanks. would be prudent to do that. Thanks, Trustee Frencher. I think that's a great idea. Just to uh, have Tiffany and her team come in and give us an update on on uh, what's being done for training for uh, teachers and coaches. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Mayor, Clerk Mayor. Yes, uh, I'd like to um, have a more complete report on what we're doing to educate children against the terrible, terrible thing known as pill abuse um, because uh, it just last year 63,000 and something people died of this terrible terrible thing that's more than the young men that died in Vietnam that's how bad this is mm -hmm. and I, I just hope that we can at least tell the kids about the hazards of it and educate them through health classes, through something, because it's really, really getting bad. 63,000 deaths, and that's more than Vietnam. Unbelievable. Thank you, Clerk Mayor, and that is uh, absolutely a national crisis, and I know there are a lot of, a lot of work being done in communities around the country, but we can work in our community here with our 64,000 plus students. So thank you. That's a that's a great idea. Any other future agenda item requests? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll go to public comment and 
Again, is there any public comment, JJ? No, no public comment. Okay, next meeting of this board will be January 30th, 2018 at 2 p.m. here in this room. And if there's nothing, yes. They changed them this month. They moved them to the third and fifth instead of the second and fourth because the, the second fell um, on during the break still. Okay. That's correct. It is. Yes, I believe it is. it is. It's been there for a little bit. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for the support today.